Why globalists always win? You may be a conservative or someone who believes in the family. You may think there is a fundamental difference between the sexes and an inherent right and wrong. You might believe there is a right way of living because you believe there is a wrong way to live. You may believe the average person is able to tell the difference between right and wrong, not based on what he wants, but on a higher truth. Even if you have trouble articulating the idea of God, you might still believe there is someone we will answer to. Life was not, in your way of thinking, composed of a meaningless chain of events leading eventually to a meaningless death. However, you never said you had all the answers. Your life never worked out quite like you wanted it to. People did not live up to what you expected. People let you down and you let yourself down. There were a lot of disappointments, in your life. However, you still believed everything worked out in the end. Somehow, good comes from out of your experience, sooner or later. However, you do have questions. There are many persons who do not live right and yet live well. There are many Christians who live right and yet suffer misfortune upon misfortune. As Christians we soon realize life is not fair and yet, for our own peace of mind we have always tried to do what is right. This is often to our detriment, as when we go to war in defense of alien persons. But fewer and fewer people agree with you or your Christian worldview. The world changed and the values of the people changed. Honesty became less important. Indeed, it became something of a liability. Success by any means necessary, was the new mantra. More and more people seemed willing to do anything for money, and often simply to feel the other person did not succeed at their expense. Behavior was often tied to pulling others down more than trying to find a way up. There appears to be an erosion of values. Things seem to have been better, before, at some earlier time. However, the concept of a golden age is sneered at by historians and no one seems to be able to pin down when this period was. Despite the mockery of a golden age most conservatives, at least, are convinced the past had something the present does not have. Perhaps it is just that past generations were clearly saner. Few observers of the human condition do not think things were more orderly when societies were more homogenous. Diversity seems to have strengthened nothing but chaos. But even here, it is obvious some diversity is better than other kinds. But liberals insist on dividing people based on race, religion and gender, when looking at history. But when it comes time to consider reparations and compensation, the intersectional value of a person is the deciding factor. The bottom indices must always pay the top categories. A person is identifiable as indigenous when benefits are being handed out but cannot be identified when looking at criminal statistics. It is vital to look at ethnicity when doing college admissions but a sign of racist intent when conducting police operations. Not all cultures are equal when mitigation of harm is being discussed but equal when social problems are on the table for discussion. Alcoholism and drug addiction is a problem, but it is a problem without any social or cultural roots. We can only pay attention to the race if it is an effort to find victims. Social problems are problems of mankind. Solutions are customized to the needs of minorities. Societal factors are never a problem of a certain slice of humanity unless we are talking about the racism of whites. Certainly, there are no cultural or social facts that apply primarily to a particular racial or ethnic segment, unless it serves to identify whites as the culprit and the source of funds for the alleviation of some issue. Liberals are not permitted to talk about problems as they relate to intersectional categories, unless the target of the discussion is being considered as a victim. In other words, we can speak and will be heard, if we align ourselves with globalism. If not, then we are cancelled, and the law is made into a weapon against us. In the West it is easy to make a connection between globalism and liberalism. The liberal secular worldview appears, to us at least, the direction in which the world is headed. However, there is pushback from other cultures. Communism, the caliphate and oriental despots all seem resistant to the changes that are sweeping over the West. Our exposure to globalism makes us look as if we are a degenerate culture. We seem to have forgotten we are the agents of our rights. We have the rights we take, no one is going to give them to us. If we do not exercise our rights, we do not have them. What you earn is yours, never to be alienated from you. But it is not a right anyone can give you, you have to take it up with your own hands. First of all, you need to create something then it is yours. This in a nutshell, is the miscalculation all authoritarians make. It is one thing to take rights, it is another to pay for them. Authoritarians want everything to be issued from a central depot, 
ultimately all authoritarians are fascists, and all fascists ultimately want a global state. Nothing, under fascism, comes to us direct from our own agency, nothing is from our own effort. What we do is alienated from us by the prior overarching rights of the state. What we get is issued to us as a benefit from the state owed where, technically this is a viable system. It is not the supply and demand chains that fail. We can envision a system in which the periphery produces goods and services in response to instructions from a central command, must as happens in the armed forces. Every input is the output of another part of the system. Each operating segment is given resources that optimizes its output to maximize the output of the entire system. At the individual level, I get the resources I need to produce the output needed by some other persons. My inputs are regulated for the precise purpose of providing the inputs needed by other designated parts of the system. If the system was entirely mechanical this would be an efficient but purposeless system. One part would produce what other parts needed to produce what still other parts needed which would at some point produce what the first parts needed to produce what they produced for the system. Everything would be kept busy but to what end? A system totally controlled at the center would be kept busy keeping busy. Machines would be doing the machine equivalent of digging holes, breaking windows and tearing up roads to build, fix and fill them up again. There would be no purpose to the system. What is missing in a fascist, state-centered system? is purpose beyond the state itself. The state becomes the reason for its existence. Objectivity is always missing from any mechanical system. There can be integration and efficiency in a centralized system, but there is never any purpose to what is done. Thus, artificial intelligence can produce documents that might be plagiarized or totally fabricated. AI has no concern for the truth. It does not matter to a machine where the data comes from or even what it actually says. The output fulfills certain criteria but the computer does not create with any purpose other than the one which can be specified in its programming. The more the system drifts towards fascism the more the purpose of civilization, goes missing. Physical systems cannot exist as God exists, for its own sake and its own glory. A self-contained system such as attempted by fascism, cannot govern itself because it cannot justify itself. There has to be an external form of oversight, to the state. This cannot be accomplished by a centrally located command structure such as that which exists in fascism. Imagine the Tsar of Russia being a tyrant and the sole arbiter as to what is produced. He will then be the arbiter of what any individual element in the economy will receive, consistent with the expectations as to what it is to produce. Is the person who owns and controls everything able to determine what another person needs? Even if he tried, how would this be accomplished, without using the same draconian methods he uses to satisfy his own desires? If the other person needed a, the tyrant has to take a house from someone else or the materials and labor from others. He cannot and would not build the house himself. But why would he give one person what others have, other than to suit the needs of himself or himself under the guise of the state? A tyrant no matter how seemingly benevolent, will always be a tyrant. A person with absolute power must always act as a dictator. But that being said, what is the alternative? Even the most democratic nation must invariably reduce the number of people who make the final decision, otherwise nothing would get decided. The larger the number of persons with authority the longer it takes for a decision to be made and indeed, over a threshold, the less likely it will be that a decision is ever made. There has to be some mechanism for reducing the number of people involved in coming to a decision, to 12 or less, if a decision is to be made in a reasonable time frame. The more power in the fewer hands, the more likely a choice will be made and the less time it will take to make it. This favors a centralized bureaucracy over a decentralized one, so far as the decision-making process is concerned. But the fact that autocrats make decisions faster than more decentralized systems, does not make fascism the preferred political system. If a group has the authority to make a decision, but not the means to capitalize the process that brings it about, then its power is moot. Politics comes down to power over property. The higher up the political ladder, one is, the more power to allocate assets to where needed or wanted, one has. This is where the tyrants specifically and parasites generally, miscalculate. They think power is all about logistics, but the most powerful person on the planet cannot take or give what does not exist. A small group with much power has an advantage over a larger group with less administrative authority, when it comes to allocating goods and services to projects. However, they generally fail when it comes to motivating the production of goods and services. Communists reign supreme in building factories. 
they are less successful in making them productive. Communists can impose routines on society but cannot tolerate a high degree of chaos, as exists in creative environments. The creative commons is not a fascist concept, for a reason. Fascists win because though humans are more creative in free societies, the creative commons, the state city in which people are not under the authority of the state. It is not significant if the people are under the authority of agents of the state. Capitalism uses private owners and communism uses bureaucrats, to conduct the affairs of the state. The point is the central authority has a hierarchy through which it imposes its will on its subjects. The hierarchy gives the state the structure it needs to impose it will onto the ranks below. As we remarked above, however, the power to organize is not the same as the power to motivate. It is true that whether the system is on the right or the left, it must still centralize power, if it is to work. In so doing, the fascist state pushes the nation and therefore, the world towards globalism. The only way this trend towards globalism can be reversed is by defeating the fascist state. But has it not been determined that it is an organization, with a steep gradient of power, that is best able to make decisions? This is so but it was also mentioned that they were not necessarily able to bring about the innovations needed, to produce civilization. Fascism can even produce the highest amount of goods and services for the state. What fascism cannot create is a creative commons or a place in which creativity is free to blossom. Globalists will always strive for efficiencies. But making things more efficient does impact what is not in place. The fascist state can make widgets with less waste, but it is less likely to replace widgets with something on a higher order of design. Creativity implies a discontinuity between what is and what will be. Fascists have a vested interest in what already exists. The person who is outside of the conventional process, is more likely to replace what is conventional knowledge. Which brings up the issue of what promotes, creativity. Is there is a common thread that binds all innovations together? What feature defines the creative commons? There can be only one consideration, if one is to be a creative person. We must ask, what can be done, with less or for less? Innovation is inversely related to entropy. Creation reverses or at least diminishes entropy. The innovation enables us to do more with the same volume of time. How do we communicate what was attempting to be said, whether culturally or linguistically, with fewer words, fewer embellishments or fewer persons? We want to get from here to a more comprehensive solution. It is as if we are looking to find the most direct route to India with no limits on how we travel. No one person can create a civilization. One group, even if composed of the best experts in the world, cannot decide what is needed. All progress is through innovation and all innovation begins in a single mind. This is the calculus that no globe has ever addressed, nor can address, without embracing metaphysics which is actually under the jurisdiction of the church. The sane, moral and civilized person will always be an apologist for ecclesiology. Even if not a Christian, rational persons understand the non-ecclesiastical option always comes down to some form of fascism. Ecclesia are the only organizational model that does not ultimately embrace fascism, that does not allow power to be concentrated in fewer hands, nor concentrates wealth in fewer persons. This statement expresses a generality, but if followed reverses the otherwise invariable result of permitting globalists to win. The alternative to fascism is ecclesiasticism. We are either under man or God and there are no other options available to us. If we deny God, we embrace the ideology of fascism and the inevitable rise of a one-world government that owns and controls everything. This makes the church the only true enemy of fascists.